Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Ruggiano, and in 1988, I was struggling with addiction, and I went into a treatment center. I set up a helpline number, which is 855-963-2113. That's 855-963-2113. That number, phones will be manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're struggling with addiction, or you know someone that is struggling with addiction, please call that number and let me help. I will be hands-on. I will be personally involved in the person's recovery. They will meet me. They will spend time with me. And I will help them live a life beyond their wildest dreams. So please, if you know anybody that has a problem with addiction or you yourself have a problem with addiction, please call that number and let me help. And also help their family members or friends. Please call that number, 855-963-2113. That's 855-963. 9632113 So Joe the cat was out of uh, out out of Manhattan but you know he he resided in Staten Island from before the Varitano Bridge was open. I mean, he goes so far back that they used to take the numbers off Staten Island by ferry. I mean, that's how far back he goes. He was he controlled all the numbers coming out of Staten Island for 50 years. Six, I mean, his whole life. He was the controller, and uh, and then and then he turned them up, he turned the numbers into the bank and other people, but the guys in the actually guys out of the Genovese family banked. Jody Katz numbers. Wow. So you couldn't write numbers in Staten Island. He had Staten Island. Lock. You know, back then, the mob had everything locked up. So Joe the Cat had the numbers locked up. Tommy Bellotti had everything else locked up. Bagels, bread, all that coming into Staten Island. Even my father. Like, my father had all the Christmas trees. You couldn't sell a Christmas tree in, in Ozone Park in East New York without my father's okay at Christmas time. You know, but Joe Cat was famous. He had a, he was a, he, he owned a travel agent, a major travel agent. He had his own airplane that he flew. He had a pilot license. And you would never know. He was on Mulberry Street every day. He would sit there, play, play solitaire. And he was a million. You would never, if you looked at him, you would never think like he was so rich. He had a compound on Lake George that was beautiful. Yeah. Matter of fact, Joe Cat owned the building the Ravenite was in. That was his building. He owned that building where the Ravenite was in. On my wedding, when I got married in 77, Joe Cat and Neil, their wedding gift to me was a trip to Vegas. Uh, they sent me to Vegas. I had a suite at Caesars Palace. I had a credit limit at the in the casino. And when I got there, I was treated like a queen. People, right this way, Mr. Ru I was 20. Now, here I am. I'm 23 years old. I got married to Alice Mayoni, Happy Mayoni, who was the Murders Incorporated's great niece. So now we have the pedigree. I'm Fat Andy's son. She's Happy Mayoni's niece, right? Murder Inc. I'm in Vegas. I get sent to Vegas by the underboss of the Gambino family and another wise guy, Joe the Cat. I get to Caesar's Palace. I'm I'm like mob royalty. They're falling all over me. I'm a kid. They're bowing to me, right this way, Mr. Ruggiano, come this way. I mean, I had a big suite in Caesar's Palace. It was, you know, it was just, um, it was crazy. It's cr I got goosebumps right now, it was crazy. Then I'm in the casino, I'm putting my finger up, you know, and I'm putting one up, they're bringing me $1,000 in chips. I'm signing, a, signing, you know, a paper for it, you know, and it, it was just crazy. Going to shows, uh, you know, going to see um, Red Fox, I saw one night, I saw, um, um, Bert Bacharach, another night I saw, you know, like all these famous entertainers. It was, it was, it was, it was uh, like Paul Anker I saw another night, you know, and I'm getting ringside tables. It, it was just uh, amazing, you know, all because of, you know, these people that, you know, these gangsters, you know, um, it's not like that anymore, you know, 
Wow. You know, it's weird because when I was a kid, the mob was one way. And then when I became like an adult adult, it was like a totally different way. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. It's like I experienced the whole gamut, like from when it was really, really good until it was really, really bad. Well, I got into life in 70. That's when I started working for my father. It was great. Uh, the seven, I went away. It was up and good. It was great until 78, till I, till I went away in 78. I came out in 80. It was still really good. My father went away in 84. I, I would say for me, when I got out of jail in 92, it's, it wasn't the same anymore. Like after John went to jail, even when John was home and I would go out with John, it was still glory days. You know, like he was like, he was like being with a celebrity, you know, especially I was, you know, was clean and sober. And, and then, you know what I mean? And he was the boss and, you know, he liked me. So he would, you know, I would always go out with him to, you know, to pastels in Brooklyn and the Brown Derby in Brooklyn. I would go to Manhattan with him for dinner. You know, Tony Lee, I would, I started, you know, I, I was pretty much driving Tony Lee around all the time then because my father was in prison. So, you know, whenever Tony Lee had to go meet him, I would take him, you know, because Tony Lee took me, even though I wasn't officially straightened out, they knew they were going to straighten me out, you know, and being that I had that kind of relationship I had with John and my father was Fat Andy, you know, John allowed me to be in, at those dinners or lunches, you know. One night we're in pastels. John, John, me, Tony Lee, uh, this guy, Bobby, they used to call him Bobby the Jew, but he wasn't Jewish, he was a wise guy. Bobby, um, Ronnie One Arm, I think was with us. There was a couple of us. Uh, and we, and so when you walked in pastels, all the way in the back was the VIP. And it was like closed off. So John had a big long table in the VIP, but you could see, so here is like the bar and the dance floor and everything, but you could look into the VIP section and you could see who's in there. So people could see it was him sitting there, you know? So, and, and the place was packed. So I would walk out into the crowd and I would like spot these like gorgeous girls and, and, and they, and I would know, and they would be looking like, and, and I would go, you want to come sit with us? Yeah. And I would bring, and I started bringing them up to the table. So I had a couple of girls at the table and he leaned over to me and he said to me, Hey, you stop bringing girls over to the table. There's enough here now. I said, all right, no problem. I told him. Yeah. I would say the party, the party stopped for me, even though in the 90s, when I got out of jail in 92, I was really making a lot of money. And I was living large personally at that time from 92 to 96 till I went to prison again. I was living large. I, that's those those um four years, me personally, I made probably the most money I ever made in my whole life, those four years personally on my own my own things, not anything to do with my father, you know, all my own stuff. I, I was living large, but as far as the mob is concerned, it was on its way out, in my opinion. But for me, I was still living large. I was still, you know, I had a beautiful home. I was still, you know, I, I was doing really well financially, but you know, that all changed. To be Stay continuously clean and sober. You have to stay vigilant, you know what I mean? You have to always remember you're an addict or an alcoholic, it never goes away. You always got to remember it only takes one to get high. You know what I mean? You just got to stay away from the first one. You know, you got to stay vigilant. You know, for me, you know, I, I had a program like the treatment center I was in. It introduced me to, you know, recovery and, and the program they introduced me to. I stuck with it even to, to this day. 35 years later, I'm still doing the same thing. It's repetition. It's what to learn how to do because there's days, listen, I haven't had a glass of wine in 34 years, but I would love to have a glass of wine. I would, I go to nice restaurants with my daughter, with my family or out on a date. I, and I see people order beautiful bottles of wine and I would love to have a glass of wine. And maybe I can have a glass of wine, but then maybe I can't. So, so, the, so the, it comes down to a decision. Am I willing to risk, risk it or Am I willing to accept the consequences that may come with this? And I'm not willing to accept the consequences that may come with it. And you got to stay vigilant. You got to stick with a program, you know, and don't use no matter what. You know, when, when you feel like getting high or having a drink, you got to use the tools that you learn in the treatment center, the phone, meetings, sponsorship, you know, go to the gym, you know, listen, cravings pass. So you just got to hold on. Cravings pass. And feelings are on facts. Just because I feel like doing something doesn't mean I have to do it.
because there's days I want to have a drink. There's days I would like to go get dressed up and go out and do a few lines of blow and have a few drinks and, and talk to the girls, you know, but, but I can't and I don't because there's, because I know from the past experiences that there's consequences behind that behavior. So you just got to stay vigilant. I mean, because listen, it never goes away. I, I did a group at work the other day and, um, and, and, and someone, a young female asked me, you know, like, why am I this way? You know, why can't I go out and have a drink recreationally? And, you know, and, and, and I looked at her and I says, well, because unfortunately that's how we're wired. That's the hand we got dealt. And you just got to accept the fact that you're not like, she goes, why couldn't my friends have a couple of drinks and go home? Why can't I do that? And I says, because you're not wired like your friends. I'm not wired like my friends. I know people like that too. I, I'm, and this is the hand we got dealt with. And this is what you have to accept. And if you accept the fact that you're not like them in that sense, you're going to keep on relapsing. I knew a guy that was um, a heroin addict. And I met him when he was dead broke, living on his mother. This is a true story. He's living on his mother's couch. Yes comes around, he gets clean, and he meets a woman, and he's clean for a lot of years, and he gets married. And, and while he's clean, he meets this guy who's a painter, paints houses, and he goes partners with him, and they start painting houses. A couple of years down the road, they start getting successful. He buys a big, big house in Huntington. He gets married. He has three kids. He's got a living maid, living large, like living large, making tons of money right? Tons of money, legal, all legit. Now he asks me to be his sponsor because I'm living out in Comac. Right? So I start sponsoring him. Now he's living in this community with like the one percenters, you know what I mean? And on the weekends, these guys, his neighbors played cards and drank. So he comes to me and he goes, you know, why ain't I, can't I be normal? Why can't I just play cards on the weekends and have a drink and and, and I told him, I said, because you're not wired that way. I said, he goes, yeah, but that's not my drug of choice. My drug of choice was heroin. I never was a big drinker. I told him, I said, listen, if you're willing to take that risk, then, you know, go for it. But I'm telling you, you're not normal like them, you know, and, and either stay away from them or, you know, go there and don't drink. And he got all bent out of shape because he wanted to be normal and he wanted to be like his neighbors and he went and started playing cards with them and started drinking. And lo and behold, one thing led to another because now we opened up that door and the monster came rushing through and he started using. His wife kicked him out. He lost his business. He lost his family. About Two years ago, I get a phone call from a friend of mine in New York. He tells me, you'll never guess who I saw the other night at a meeting. I said, who? It's just, I don't want to mention the person's name because people out there might know who it is. So-and-so's at the meeting. I go, wow, how's he doing? He goes, how's he doing? He's back living on his mother's couch. So need, need I say more? That's the disease of addiction. What I would say to them is you have the toughest, hardest decision a parent can make. It's called tough love. Um, you have to allow them to hit a bottom and pray to God they stay alive. You know, you have to try to get them into treatment and how to get them into treatment is you have to not enable them, cut them off financially, you know, um, change your locks, don't let them in your house, don't give them any money, don't believe 99.9% .9 of the things they tell you because they're going to promise you the world and give them ultimatums. They want your help. They have to go to treatment. They want your help. They have to go to detox. And hopefully when they're in detox or when they're in treatment, the light will go off in their head and they might get clean and they might not. You got to understand there's a very small percentage of people that make it in recovery, unfortunately, but it's not impossible. It's up to the individual. And a parent has to, you know, just do the toughest thing in the world. I spoke at a conference years ago in Michigan to parents of, of addicts and alcoholics, of, of family members of fam addicts and alcoholics. And at the end of the conference, some people walked up to me to talk to me. And there was this couple standing off to the side. 
So when the people that would talk to me left, this couple walked up to me. And the father and the mother asked me if they could talk to me. And I said, yes. And they said, listen, we have a 19-year-old daughter. She's strung out on heroin. You know, we don't know what to do. So I says to them, well, where does she live? They said, she lives with us. I said, does she pay rent? They said, no. I said, how does she get around? Well, we bought her, we gave her a car. I said, you who makes the payments? They said, we do. Who pays the car insurance? They said, we do. I said, does she have keys to the house? They said, yeah. So she comes and goes as she wants. They said, yeah. They said, I said, how does she get money? Does she work? No. Does she go to school? No. How does she get money? They go, we give her an allowance. I said, okay, this is what you have, this is what you got to do. When you leave here today, go home. She, she's out, right? They go, yeah, go home, call a locksmith, have a locksmith come over, change the locks. Tell her, call her up, tell her to return the car, otherwise you're going to report it stolen. When she knocks out your car, at your door and begs you to let her in or begs you for money, ignore her. I said, and hopefully she'll hit a bottom, tell her the only way she's allowed back in the house and the only way she could have a car back and have her life back is if she goes to treatment. I said, you have to be tough love. The father looked me in the face and he went like this. I can't do that. I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. When I was a counselor, I had another situation with a, with, with a, with a, with a family and my clinical director, when they asked me and my clinical director what they could do because they were enablers, my clinical director told them, buy a coffee. Parents are in a tough situation. You know what I mean? Like my father was, my father's love was killing me. My father, my father was a perfect case of an enabler. Like he gave me anything I wanted, which was great at the time, but was not good for me. He was a perfect, so for a parent to help a child with addiction, it's about tough love, man. And I see it every day. I see parents, you know, having three, having, uh, having calls with the therapist, you know, family meet and, and the, and the parents are siding with the, with the child and not, and not the therapist. It's just, uh, it's tough. It's tough for a parent. It's tough, but the parents have to just, uh, you know, get, be, be tough be, be, and, and do what's hard. By them helping, by them, if, listen, if a person that's on drugs has, doesn't have no consequences, why get clean? If, a, if I have a place to live and a place to eat and a place to crash and I have transportation, why should I get clean? Right? Well, if there's no consequences, why should I stop? 